Let's take our Bibles and go to the book of Acts, chapter 17. Acts, chapter 17. And we'll read verses 10 through 11. Or 10 and 11, I guess. Acts 17, verses 10 and 11. And the brethren immediately sent away Paul and Silas by night into Berea, who coming thither went into the synagogue of the Jews. These were more noble than those in Thessalonica, in that they received the word with all readiness of mind and searched the scriptures daily, whether those things were so. And let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the example of the, uh, the believers in Berea, uh, those that were uh, sincere in their search for you and allowed uh, the truth to take root in their hearts. Lord, I pray that that would uh, be true of us also this evening. We pray that as we come to your word, we would be seeking you and find you there. Uh, help me as I preach. Help all of us uh, that listen. And uh, may your word accomplish what it is sent forth to do. For we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Here's something interesting. The Apostle Paul, when he would go to a new city or new town, he would uh, seek out a synagogue. And that was... I guess the Jewish equivalent of a church. The, it wasn't really um, what we would call a church, but it was where the Jews showed up for their religious instruction. And a rabbi, a teacher would teach. They would open uh, what we would refer to as the Old Testament and they would teach from that. Of course, the Apostle Paul had uh, uh, official training in this manner and he was a, a Bible scholar and uh, uh, so he kind of would share his credentials and they'd say, oh, why don't you preach for us? Or why don't you teach for us while you were here? And so he would, you know, well, where are you at in your study? And he would basically pick up, uh, they may not have the entire Bible. They might only have one or two books of, of uh, the Old Testament. But he would open up and he would teach them about Jesus from those Old Testament scriptures. And so they... He and, and Silas wind up in Berea. They get chased out of one town. They go to Berea. Uh, the first place he goes to is to the Jews. Uh, the Bible talks about going to the Jew first and then to everybody else. And if the Jews rejected the message about Christ, well, then he would, uh, he would then turn his attention to the Gentiles, the non-Jewish the non people. And he would try to reach them for Christ and establish a church with them. And so here we find those that are in the synagogue of the Jews. <clears throat> and the Bible says of them, it says that they searched the scriptures daily, whether those things were so. Well, the first thing that they did, it says uh, in verse 11 there, these were more noble than those in Thessalonica and that they received the word with all readiness of mind. And so they, they came to the teaching of the Bible with an open mind. Uh, they hadn't decided what they already thought about the Bible to begin with. Uh, they were willing to allow the preacher to preach to them, but they didn't just take his word for it. And, and that's a good thing. I, I've uh, never wanted people to just, just take my word for it. Just believe what I say because I say it. I encourage you to get into the Bible and study it and read it for yourself because God said of these people, that's something that made them more noble than other people. And the church in Thessalonica was a pretty good church. And so, but it says the Bereans, uh, there was a way in which the Bereans had those Thessalonians beat. And it was that not only did they listen to the preaching, did they take the preaching in, but then they also daily, they, they got into the Bible and they searched the scriptures daily, whether those things were so. Now, who was it that did this? It was those that attended the synagogue of the Jews. And <clears throat> the Bible goes on, verse 12 says, Therefore many of them believed also of honorable women, which were Greeks, and of men, not a few. So there was a lot of people that got saved because of what was going on. And not just Jewish people, but it says of the Greeks. That's a, a word that was often used interchangeably with the Gentiles. And, and it says... Uh, honorable women and of men it says not a few which so not a few would be a lot so a lot of men got saved as well and so what they would have been taught 
when they showed up for the teaching of, you know, for the Bible teaching, the only portion of Bible that they had is what we would call the Old Testament. And for the most part, Jews to this day, they study what we would refer to as the Old Testament. And uh, <clears throat> so they would have been taught from the Old Testament. They wouldn't have been taught about Jesus. When they went to the synagogue, their normal teacher um, wouldn't have stood up and said, well, let's, uh, uh, let's look in the book of Matthew and, and read some, script, some passages there. They didn't have the book of Matthew yet. And even when the book of Matthew came on the scene, in general, the Jewish people didn't accept it as scripture. They still don't accept it as scripture. They don't accept Jesus as the son of God. And, and so they don't spend time teaching that and, and, and preaching it in, in the synagogues today. But they would have been taught the Old Testament, not necessarily about Jesus. Now, the Messiah, yes, they were taught, hey, there's a savior that's gonna come someday. Um, the anointed one of God, and that's what the word Christ means. The Christ means uh, the anointed one, God's anointed one, uh, Messiah. And so Paul and Silas come, Paul probably tells them about his credentials, where he studied the scripture uh, at the feet of Gamaliel. And, uh, well, why don't you teach for us while you're here in town? And so he stands up and teaches, and, and he teaches them that Jesus is the Christ, that Jesus is the anointed one of God. Jesus is the Messiah. Jesus is the Savior. And they listened to the preaching, but they also went looking in the scripture to verify that preaching. They didn't automatically say, nope, we don't want to hear anything about this Jesus fellow. Uh, you're just trying to cause division and stirring up trouble. They, they, they listened, but they said, uh, well, we're going to see what the Bible says about that. And they searched the scriptures daily to verify that. Uh, and what was it that they searched for? They were searching for the truth. When they went through the Bible, and, and I say the Bible, keep in mind that's uh, the Old Testament, whatever portion of scripture they might have had at that particular synagogue. And they were searching to see if, if uh, uh, to, to find the truth there. Now, Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. And, and so they're searching to verify the truth of, of the preaching of Paul and Silas. Now, let me pause for just a moment and say this. You can find pretty much anything you want in the Bible. Throughout history, many have taken the Bible, these words, and they've twisted them. They've lifted little pieces out of context and, and caused those little pieces to say something that God never intended to say. And, and you say, well, are you saying you know the intentions of God? Uh, well, I know that many times God makes his intentions clear. And, and people take and they... they they wrestle with these words and they twist them, they pervert them, they change them, uh, they take them out of order. Um, for example, um, <clears throat> let's go to the book of John chapter three. And I'll give you a, uh, an example of a discussion I had with someone. Um, and this particular person believed that um, you had to be uh, baptized to get to heaven. And of course, the first question I said to them was, well, what about the thief on the cross? Jesus guaranteed he would be in heaven with them that evening, that night. And, and so, I mean, it's, that, that's pretty much, we can't argue that. And that fella never got baptized. He was hanging on the cross when he got saved, never had a chance to get baptized. And, and they say, well, you know, that was, uh, that was still during the Old Testament days. Well, the fact is Jesus died before the thief did, and at his death is when the New Testament era came into uh, came on the scene, and so that argument isn't isn't valid. But uh, uh, they want to come here to John chapter three, where Jesus is having a, a discussion with Nicodemus, <clears throat> and let's start in verse one here at the very beginning of it, that, so we get the whole context. There was a man of the Pharisees, that's the religious train, the religious elite, if you will. Uh, named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. The same came to Jesus by night and said unto him, Rabbi, we know that thou art a teacher come from God, for no man can do these miracles that thou doest, except God be with him. Jesus answered and said unto him, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, 
except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. And so here Jesus says, Nicodemus, you must be born again. Let's read on. Verse four, Nicodemus saith unto him, how can a man be born when he's old? Can he enter the second time into his mother's womb and be born? Jesus answered, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born of water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. And so they say, see here, water, that's baptism. It's not baptism. They say you have to be born again of the water. Well, the Bible doesn't say born again of the water. In verse 3, he said, except a man be born again. And he doesn't use the word water until we get down to uh, verse 5. And so it's, and, and in between there, somebody else has spoken. So Jesus spoke, said, except a man be born again, he cannot uh, see the kingdom of God. Then Nicodemus speaks, he asks a question, and then Jesus speaks again. So it's, there's, there's a clear division between those two statements, and, and yet they will, they will take those and They'll take something out of the middle and they'll combine them and say, see, the Bible says you must be born again of the water. Water is what makes you born again. And that is not what the Bible says here. Uh, <clears throat> the Bible is talking about a physical birth. When, when you know, what happens in labor and delivery uh, departments of hospitals. And he's talking about a spiritual birth. And that can take place anywhere. Uh doesn't have to be in church. That can take place here. It can take place in your driveway, on the front porch, in the living room, in the kitchen, in the garage, uh, out back, out front, off to the side, anywhere uh, is where that can take place. And really, babies have been born in, in any number of places as well. But uh, So he's talking about two different things. He's talking about a physical birth and a spiritual birth. You say, how do you know that? Well, let's read on here. So again, verse five, Jesus answered, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born of water and of the spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. Now verse six, that which is born of the flesh is flesh. What's that? That's the water birth. When you were born, your, your mother's water broke, very likely. Um, you had to be taken out of that, that sack of water um, in order to, <laughs> to make your way into this world outside of the womb. And he says, so that which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the spirit is spirit. So he's talking physical versus spiritual. And he said, and Nicodemus was thinking, I have to be born physically twice. How can that happen? And Jesus said, no, you're born physically once, and you need to be born spiritually once. That's a second birth. That's another birth. Uh, that's being born again. Uh, and he says, marvel not that I said unto thee, ye must be born again. So that's an example of where people will take a portion of scripture and, and twist it and say, see, you have to be baptized. They'll, they'll, let me uh, take you to another passage, Mark chapter 15. Uh, Mark chapter 15. I believe it's 15. I was wrong. Mark 16. Mark 16, 15. It says, Afterward, he appeared unto the eleven as they sat at meat and upbraided them with their unbelief and hardness of heart, which they believed not, uh, because they believed not them which had seen him after he was risen. Verse 15. And he said unto them, Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. So we call this the Great Commission, where Jesus is teaching his disciples, his followers, Go into the whole world and preach the gospel. In Matthew, he says, and teach all nations. Now, verse 16, he that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. And they'll say, see there, you have to be baptized to be saved. Wait a minute. But he that believeth not shall be damned. It doesn't say he that believeth and doesn't get baptized is damned. It says the one that doesn't believe, the one that doesn't trust, the one that doesn't place his faith in Jesus is the one that's that's condemned, um, <clears throat> and and so they'll they'll take that and they'll take a few words out of context and try to match, uh, try to make it match what they want to teach and what they want people to believe. And and it's okay if you want to listen to somebody preach, but you need to make sure that you get in the Bible 
and and look for the right things there because many people all throughout history they twisted the bible uh cults have arisen out of just little pieces and portions that have been taken out of context and and uh, uh just a, a micro uh <clears throat> focus has been placed on two or three words and the rest of the context all around it has been left out of the picture now Make sure you search for the right thing. Because like I said, you can find, you know, people have made the Bible say whatever they wanted it to say. They, you can twist the words of it uh, and, and kind of make it say what you want it to say. So make sure you're searching for the right thing. What I'm saying is before you read, before you read the Bible, decide what you're looking for. Because you're likely to find what you're looking for. So as you come to the Bible, if you have decided that you're looking for something to straighten out your spouse, then you'll find something that applies to them. Or I want something that'll straighten out my neighbor. Well, you'll find something that applies to them. I want something that'll straighten out the preacher. Where's, where's an area where the preacher's imperfect? Well, you can find that. Well, I'm looking for something to straighten out my brother or straighten out my sister. I want, uh, I need to find something in here that will straighten out my, uh, one of my siblings. One of my sisters said, uh, we had a, we had a rule. We weren't supposed to kiss, uh, when we were dating. And she said, look, the Bible says, greet the brethren with an holy kiss. She wanted to present that as permission to do so. Well, uh, the Bible does say that. If you study the context and study the culture, uh, the men greeted each other with a kiss. The men in the Middle East will still grab each other by the shoulders and they'll pull in and they'll give each other a kiss on the cheek. And uh, <clears throat> I'm glad God didn't call me to be a missionary over to that part of the world. I just as soon uh, not kiss men or anybody else for that matter. Um, but what I'm saying is you can find what you're looking for. You need to be careful what you're looking for in the Bible. Are you looking for something that you think will straighten somebody else out? Well, that's not going to help you very much, and it's probably not going to help them very much. Now, unless somebody has come to you and said, uh, I'm struggling with this issue, do you know some scripture that might help me? That's different, but I'm, I'm talking about... There's something somebody else has done that you don't like. It's rubbing you the wrong way. And you're going to find some scripture to, to, to just straighten them out. I don't know that that's the right thing to do. Before reading, decide what you're looking for. Are you looking for something to justify what you've already decided you're going to do? The Bible talks about people that turn the grace of God into lasciviousness. And they'll use the grace of God as, as uh, a license to do all manner of sin. Well, we're under grace. We're not under the law now, so I don't have to listen to the law. That, that's, and this is going to sound mean, but that's kind of idiotic. You know, if, if that's the case, what's to keep me from, from putting a bullet between your eyes? We're not under the law, and that the law is what tells us thou shalt not kill. Murder is wrong. Well, if we're not under the law anymore, then I guess everything goes. Well, the law, you know, it's not what gets you saved. No, it isn't. But it's a good thing to follow. And the law was given to show us that we needed a Savior. It was given to show us what righteousness is. And the Bible tells us that it is righteousness that exalteth a nation. And so the closer a nation gets to living a righteous way, God is obligated then to exalt and lift that nation up. But a lot of people come to the Bible and they're looking for something in it that will justify what they want to do. And they're looking for permission for some sin. The Holy Spirit within them is saying, now you know that's wrong. 
And so they'll look for something, they'll take it out of context and say, look, here, this person did that. That means I have permission to do it. No, nope. not everything that the Bible says that people did is right. Just because somebody in the past did it and the Bible has recorded that act doesn't mean that what they did was right. Within the first few chapters of the Bible, we find a man murdering his brother. It doesn't mean it's right. It doesn't mean that God allowed that and that God put a stamp of approval on it. God's just recording what happened and, and told what punishment that man got. And so, but if you're looking, as you read the Bible, if you're looking for something to justify your deeds, uh, you're likely able to find it. Does that mean that now that you've found that verse and you think that gives you permission to do something that you ought to do it? It doesn't mean that at all. In fact, the Apostle Paul, God recorded through him, all things are lawful unto me, but not all things are expedient. Not all things are good. You know, as a child, I was talking about, well, I've, you know, what, what would a child choose as their diet? You put a plate of carrots in front of them and a plate of chocolate cake, and they're probably going to choose that cake. And that's why it's up to parents to say, we need to give them good choices. We need to give them a choice between good and good, not a choice between good and bad. Once you're an adult, hey, I, I, can, I can choose to buy anything I want at the store. I can choose to put anything I want on the table. There's no law against me going to the store and, and buying only refined sugar products. There's no law against that. It's probably not good for me. It's definitely not good for me. For that to be a big part of my diet. And so, but people say, see, there's no law against it. We're not bound by the law anymore. And they'll, they'll use the Bible. What are you looking for when you read the Bible? Be careful before you read to decide what it is that you're looking for. Are you looking for something to draw you closer to God? If you're looking for that, as you read the Bible, you will find things that will draw you closer to God. The Bible says, humble yourself. Uh, before God. It says, draw nigh unto him, and he will draw nigh unto you. And so the Bible tells us ways in which we can get closer to God. Is that what you're looking for when you read the Bible? And a lot of people say, well, I, I just don't, uh, you know, when I read the Bible, it doesn't make a whole lot of sense to me. What are you looking for? Are you looking for anything? Try looking for something. Look for something as you read it. Are you going to find it in the first verse? Maybe not. But as you keep reading, as you keep reading, you'll find it. What else is something to look for? Well, the Thessalon the, the Bereans, I'm sorry, <clears throat> they came to listen to the preaching. It's possible sometimes they heard something in the preaching they didn't like. Well, let me verify that in the scripture. They were looking to see whether it was so. They were looking for the truth in the scripture. Before reading, decide what you're looking for. How about something to help you be more Christ-like? As you read through the Bible, not looking for, well, I want to change this doctrine or change that doctrine. Just let it say what it says. As you read it, don't try to get it to validate what you're already doing, what you've already decided to do. Don't look for the Bible to validate your upbringing. Now, I'll, I'll, I'll give you a little tidbit of news. Your parents were human also. They're capable of some mistakes. And all parents make a mistake or two in the rearing of their children. As, as hard as they try to do right by their kids and to do right in their interactions and their dealings with them, at some point or another, they're going to make a mistake. And we say, well, I'm going to, I'm going to raise my kids the same way my parents raised me. Why, why not get in the Bible and see whether those things were so? And what 
instead of, I'm, I'm going to justify everything I do. I've already decided what I'm going to do, and I'm just going to find scripture to justify what I've already decided to do. Why don't you just decide to do what the Bible says to do? Instead of having to justify what you already made up your mind to do and search the scriptures. Search the scriptures for that which would draw you closer to God. Search the scriptures for that which would make you more Christ-like. Search the scriptures for that which would make you a better light in a dark and sinful world. Search the scriptures for right things. Search the scriptures for God to tell you what's right instead of for you to tell God what you've already decided is right. Let's stand and we'll close with a word of prayer this evening. Our Heavenly Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for the Bereans who searched the scriptures daily. They were looking for truth. They wanted verification of what they were hearing. They wanted to know you better. They wanted to know about Christ and to know him better. May that be our goal as well. We pray that as we leave here, you would take us safely from here and return us again at the appointed hour. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Lord bless you.